Hello, everybody. My name is, as you said, Chris Henry. I'm a senior biology engineer at Smith College. And um, thank you all for taking time today to come to see present. Um, my research that I was able to do last summer related to grants by SCICU, both here and at Clemson, on the computational modeling of missing mutations in the mutant liver subject. And so basically, like, when you look at this, you're really like, okay, what is that? Well, basically, it's fancy words of Spain. I use multiple, pretty much, computer analyzing techniques to predict whether or not these certain naturally occurring mutations in your DNA will affect these proteins and their stability, which may or may not cause you to be more susceptible to developing substance dependence disorders. And that all is that all throughout the presentation. Brief overview, I'm just going to split up in two parts. The first one is the background. I'm talking about the GPCRs, what they are, which is the structure and the signaling and the activation. And then we'll talk about substance dependence and the my second part is how we use this information to apply it to talk about crystallized, newly crystallized structure, MOR mutations specifically, and the different computational methods that I use, including BLAST, SDM, the Jack, and the Tape package, and Chimera. And finally, I'm going to wrap it up with the conclusion, and I'm going to lead you to what future works I think this research should head in. Okay, to start off with, like I mentioned, um, these mutations destabilize certain proteins. What are these proteins? They're known as G protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs for short. And in 2012, they actually won the Nobel Prize for research in AIDS and the Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, for Lefkowitz and Bilka and their co-workers for their work on the crucial <coughs> work that was crucial for the understanding of how two protein coupled receptors work. And these are actually the largest known receptors in the family and constitute 4% of the entire human genome. And the major reason that these are a hot topic for modern research is because they're a target for nearly 40% of all modern pharmaceutical drugs. <coughs> And so a little bit more about the actual structure and how they actually function. So this is actually a linear model of a cell. Um, this is the cell membrane right here. And so as you can see, this is our GPCR. Um, you have seven telltale out helixes, which are transmembrane domains that actually pass from the outside to the inside of the cell. Now on the outside, you have your amino chip. This is actually a linear chain of amino acids, which end in an amino group. And on the inside of the cell, you have your carboxyl chain, which is a linear one of amino acids, which end in a carboxyl group. And so basically they're also connected by intercellular and extracellular loops, which are linear amino acid chains. And so what happens, you have an extracellular signal, or a messenger, known as a ligand. And this can be made of lipids, hormones, or anything like neurotransmitters. So this extracellular signal will actually come and bind to that outside of the actual receptor. And it can bind into the amino terminus, or actually bind physically inside of the actual membrane, inside these different pockets. So it'll actually bind inside this pocket, and it will create a conformational change, an actual change in the protein, and it will affect these proteins right here. This is made up of an alpha, a beta, and a gamma subunit. And so what will happen is that this change will occur, and it will phosphorylate around a phosphate group, this alpha group, and that will actually separate from the beta and gamma. So you have your phosphorylated GTP and your alpha subunit, and they will actually carry on into the cell and create multi, multiple intracellular responses. This is known as a cascade effect. And it can amplify a signal at order of magnitudes in milliseconds, which is where it's why it's very vital for actually human function. And so specifically, I just talked about GPCRs as a type protein. Well, the specific one I chose was the mu opioid receptor. Uh, I chose this uh, doctor, Nishinova upstairs. She gave me a list of several different ones to actually choose from. I did a little research, and I found that this one was the most interesting one because it had to do with actual substance dependence, which I feel like Everybody in here has been at least somewhat subjected to, or just been exposed to, um, that can be anything from tobacco, alcohol, or drugs as far as like even pharmaceuticals. And it's actually a subclass of adoption, and it belongs to the opioid family. And it's named for its prototypical, or its usually associated agonist, which would be morphine, hence the mu. And it's natural energy to effects, and it's naturally activated by its naturally found ligand in the body, which includes enkephalins and beta endorphins. And researchers have been able to use radioactive, radioactive isotopes to actually find out that they're highly concentrated in the brain, central nervous system, and in some of the digestive system. Which is why I don't know if any of y'all have ever been on any strong painkillers, but you might suffer from constipation. That's because these GPCRs that are found in your actual digestive system, they actually halt or inhibit the peristaltic effects of your intestines, which cause you to be constipated. Uh, and also, why the MOR is because I can see from 1999 to 2006, so over a span of seven years, the number of deaths has increased from 21% to over 37%. That's almost, 
That's almost twice the amount of deaths that we've spent in seven years, and it's continually increasing. And also, it's reported that it costs over six hundred million dollars in annual revenue to for anything from medical costs to rehabilitation for these surface centers. And so, like I said, um, it's about ligands, which are these extracellular messengers. And the one that I focus on was morphine. And it's known as an agonist. It's actually a super agonist, and it stimulates the response. It actually um, further stimulates it, and it creates a stronger effect. You have antagonists, which binds the receptors and actually inhibit the response. And certain agonists will actually induce this effect called constitutive activity, which is actually called overexpression, which is when it doesn't know when it's off, or it does not be phosphorylated, so it continually expresses it and creates an undesired effect. And this is constitutive activity. This is what I'm mainly focusing on. This is the main mechanism behind this drug dependence. Uh, as you can see, it's a little schematic. Um, this is morphine, our living interest. This is our GPCR and the MMR. The morphine will actually bind to the receptor, and as I said, it creates a change, and it will actually dissociate these subunits. Um, this is an identical cyclase, and this, along with other things such as sodium potassium pumps and calcium pumps, so will actually be responsible for your pain signaling. They send pain to your, they say, they tell your brain, hey, something's wrong, fix it, this is, something's painful. And so, actually, by the association with this receptor, it actually takes these subunits and actually blocks the identical cyclase, which blocks the production of simple A and P which then inhibits the effect of feel pain. So then your brain's like, okay, I'm not feeling any pain, but something's still obviously wrong, and it's still receiving signals. So then it'll actually produce more of these actual GPCRs. So it'll produce more of these GPCRs, and that's called upregulation. Okay, so now say, you're done, you're off your meds. Okay, so now what you have, you have a, actually have a bloated GPCR system, you have more receptors than you actually start off with. And so then, now it takes more of a stimulus to actually activate these receptors which is leads to withdrawal symptoms. And so that was pretty much what I learned from my research. And so I took all that I learned, so everything about GPCRs and how the mechanism actually function, and I applied that into the actual research to see how these specific mutations actually alter the stability of these proteins. So this right here, as I mentioned, um, they won the Nobel Prize for the research in the crystallized structure. Um, this is actually a picture from the first publication. And as you can see, this is the Telltale 7 alpha helixes over here. And what you can see is the view from the top, so it's a peer review. And this red and green substance that's in the left is actually called beta phenylphenidine, which is actually an antagonist, which is very important because this is what we want. We want antagonists, and doing that will counteract the actual effect of this protein. And this process of extracellularity has become a very, very recently, recently practiced thing. And it's, very, it's become very complicated because they really did not know how to do it. That's because the membrane of the cell is actually very fluid, it's actually very motile and it moves. I don't know if you all ever tried to take a picture, I'm sure you have, it's something moving, it's very blurry. Same thing with these, except for these are like on a very, very, very micro scale, so imagine how hard that is. So they actually attached um, a lysozyme to the bottom and it actually was able to hold the cell membrane in place and hold it still long enough to take these pictures. So that's why, as I said, these intercellular loops that usually connect these transmembranes are missing because it was actually replaced by this T lysozyme. And another picture from the actual publication just shows the actual binding body. And these are where the ligands interact with the actual receptor. This just shows comparison. Um, this is our interest protein, the MOR, and this is the muscarinic free receptor. This just to show the comparison of how the depth of the actual binding pocket, as you can see, this is a little deeper, this was a little more exposed. And um, this is really important because this is like the first publication of how the actual ligand physically um, responds to the actual protein. And so then we move on to the mutations. So we know the structure, we know how they bind, so then we move on to the specific mutations of this actual protein. So through numerous and numerous studies done, um, protein sequencing is not a very new thing. Actually, just a lot is. So they've been able to identify certain proteins and amino acid makeup and so they take actual samples from people that have been diagnosed with substance dependence disorders, and they have actually been able to sequence these proteins. And so through numerous uh, researching and studies, they've identified 13 commonly found, these are 13 of the most commonly found mutations in this actual protein. And so out of these 13, we chose four. And right here, I have a really little legend, a little key. Basically what this means, um, the first letter, that's just a single letter code for the type of amino acid, so that's serine. The second one is cysteine. So serine is naturally found, and so serine at 147 is replaced with cysteine, which is a mutant. 
Same thing with all other ones. So asparagine at 132 with aspartate, arginine at 260 with histamine, and valine at 293 with isoleucine. And so why do we pick these? Well, as I said in the picture I just showed, the binding pocket um, actually binds inside the transmembrane domains. And so we choose these two right here. These are actually lo located in the transmembrane domains. So we were guessing, all right, there's going to be any massive instability in the actual protein and the structure and the effects of the binding is going to be found here. So that's why we chose these three. And we actually chose this one, the arginine at 260, because as I mentioned, the, the complex of proteins, the alpha, beta, gamma, subunit, are bound to the inside of the protein. And so we figured if there's going to be a stabiliz a destabilization in the protein binding and dissociation, it would be found here in this arginine. And so we use multiple competition met methods, some early <coughs> online, such as BLAST, SDM, we go over all these, and the comprehensive studies. We did that at Clemson, um, using, uh, in coalition and collaboration with their bioinformatics department up there, and we use the Palmetto Supercomputer Cluster in Condor, which is a computing system with over 2,000 uh, computer, computing systems. And um, so basically, what you saw the picture of earlier, the 3D structure, that was actually found, that's actually the MOR of a mouse. All right, and I know we're not, we're not setting out to find the cure drug issue of mice, that's not important at all. Um, and so basically what I did, what we used that for, because that is what was given to us. That is what they first crystallized, and that's what's published. So that's what we used. And so to show that there's actually some scientific merit in what we did, I actually did a consensus sequence, or I aligned the different gene, or actually different protein census, protein sequences between the mouse and the human. Okay, as you can see here, um, the top line is the human, the bottom line is the mouse. And so this is actually a linear representation of the amino acid makeup. So it's the mouse and the human. And the most important part right here is the blue. That's known as the consensus sequence. So every blue letter you see is amino acid that is somehow synonymous between the human and the mouse. There's actually a 95% overall similarity between the mouse and the human. There's a 97% similarity between the mouse and the human found.